Has everybody had a chance to take a look at the agenda? Any questions, comments? I have a motion to approve. So. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. As we do at the beginning and end of every meeting, we have opportunities for a comment from the public. Is there anybody from the public that would like to come speak? If I may, Mr. Chairman. Prior to you coming up professionally and speaking with us as a group, we're going to have your whole team. I didn't know how you were going to proceed. No, this is that. We're going to have your whole team come up. <laughs> we're going to have you all come up. Okay. Uh, I do want to begin this evening uh, before we invite uh, Mr. Clark and uh, uh, Wilton Security Task Force up to talk to us to begin by, uh, by saying that this is obviously an incredibly important topic, uh, I, I believe, for each of us personally as well as for the town. We've discussed at this table a fair amount the, uh, the importance of a threat assessment coordinator and the importance of threat assessment coordination. Um, for those of you watching here uh, locally as well as on television, um, I'd like to put the question to the board uh, not as any sort of formal vote, but to set the stage for this evening. Um, is there anyone here that questions the need to coordinate threat assessments within our schools? No. No. Okay. With that, is it safe to say that we believe that there is a need for threat assessment coordination at some level? Okay. I, I only set that stage so that the Wilton Security Task Force understands where we're coming from. Uh, the question then in front of us is what level is, uh, is appropriate? So with that, I'd like to, uh, to welcome uh, Hal Clark and the Wilton Security Task Force to come up and join us up front if you would, and hopefully we'll have a, uh, a good discussion. We need a few extra chairs. State of Connecticut thrust upon the schools the, uh, the need to deal with bullying. Of course, that did not come with money. So, uh, what immediately happened is people were already trying to worry about how to create the best educational environment for students, were suddenly told they had another task to perform. There is not much distance, frankly, between someone who can professionally direct a response to bullying and a threat assessment coordinator. The research shows that about 75% of those students who turn out to act violently have in fact been bullied. So you can't be a good threat assessment coordinator, frankly, unless you have a very good grasp of bullying. And we all know that the bullying doesn't start in one grade. It starts a long time ago, and the resentment builds and builds and builds. What we really want in this recommendation is a job description that was written, I might add, by employees of the Board of Education, as well as the Security Task Force, but I don't think we admitted what they put in. But these functions, oh, 
<laughs> that these functions <laughs> be performed. Um, and with that, I'd kind of like to, you know, just one other last thing. Uh, Wilton has always taken a leadership position. I believe with the recommendations that you've already accepted for the second SRO, that we're going to the town with, and hopefully the town will accept for the physical enhancements to our facilities. And with all of the functions of the threat assessment coordinator, we will be the leader in at least Fairfield County in responding to a world in which we never wanted to deal. And I can remember when I, when we came to Wilton, we talked about safe schools. Safe schools meant kind of comforting, a place where somebody could learn at their own speed and be supported. That was really the definition of safe. We never thought about safety in terms of somebody getting physical harm, maybe a fight. But that was about it. What a sad world we've come to and what a sad thing we all have to deal with now. Where safety has to take on a much more life-threatening or damaging kind of purview. But it is where we are and we will rise to the occasion. I'm confident we will rise to the occasion as well as possible. Right, let me turn it over to you because I think you had a conversation okay. with you that would be yeah. helpful. I, I did speak with uh, Dr. Bernstein today. Um, we had a discussion about a threat coordinator for the school system and I told him that my thoughts were that whether it was somebody within the existing faculty or somebody outside of the faculty you know, it's a new position it was something that we we desired as a security task force I would like to have as the police chief because I think it's very important to the safety of your faculty your employees and your students um, it's up to I believe the Board of Education to decide whether that position should be an expansion of a present position where someone was then um, uh, do the threat assessing, but in a hybrid position with what they already have. But I don't know, and it's not for me to say whether you have that ability within your current faculty. I don't know all of their job duties. I don't know how overworked, how overloaded they are. Um, it's not for me to say. It's for the Board of Education. Um, I do know that in speaking with Dr. Bernstein, he felt that there was somebody within the current faculty that he could train that would be adequate and do a good job for the citizens and the Board of Education for the school system. The value added is that you have someone now overlooking, we don't get, without getting into details, you have someone now overlooking the threats that come into each school, but not just the threats to bullying, because as Mr. Clark said earlier, the majority of the school violence cases that occur, there was at least 75% have come back and the report is that they were bullied for many years. So if you have someone who has an overview of what's going on throughout the district and who's addressing these situations and has the ability and has their forensic um, knowledge to do assessments of people, I think you're going to be, uh, Wilton will be much more better place than it is than most Fairfield County towns. I really do. And, and in my discussion with Dr. Bernstein, he totally agreed. He said that he's just, um, if we can get this position in place, he said, you guys are going to be in a real good place for your community. And Wilton has always had a very high standard of education in, in all of Connecticut and probably throughout the nation. And I just think that in the world we live in today, the education we provide is obviously very essential and critical to their futures, but so obviously with where we are today in this world, so is their, their safety is something we've really got to take a real strong look at and do the best we can. I, we owe that to everybody. We owe that to the students, we owe it to your faculty, and we owe it to the community. I think you're right. Uh, there's no question about it. We've, we've deliberated uh, uh, a number of times on it, and, and it brings us back to, as, as I open the meeting, you know, we agree. Uh, we're in, we're in strong agreement. Yeah. I hesitate to use the term violent agreement. Um, Probably appropriate in this case. <laughs> yeah. uh, and especially in light of you know un unfortunate circumstances uh, in our in our neighboring towns, so, you know, it, it it hits us all even harder. So the the question that that I think we're wrestling with is uh, what level of coordination do we think is appropriate? Going to be uh, meeting the job description that you've laid out, that the, the experts have laid out. I know that our board is, uh, as individuals, are wrestling with it. 
um, and I think we're here tonight to, to try to to try to work through it. Yeah. Um, we have a proposal in front of us from the administration uh, that uh, looks at uh, adding it to the uh, job responsibilities of, of an existing employee. Um, that job would be posted, so I don't know that uh, it would be one employee over another. I think it has to be evaluated. Um, we had a conversation at the table about uh, perhaps Dr. Bernstein participating in that process with us to make sure that who we end up with would, would be appropriate. But I, I'd like to hear, if it would be all right with you, to hear from each of your task force members to get their, their take as well on, uh, on, on the position. Would that, would that work? Can I just ask a general question sure. before they do that? When you first presented to us, um, it was presented as a full-time individual and we unanimously approved that and agreed with that, although there was question as to what budget does it belong in and all, that's another discussion. Um, but I'm curious because when Dr. Bernstein was here last week and he was speaking in support of a hybrid thing, one of the gentlemen that you sent to read a statement on your behalf seemed to indicate that that was the, he was, he's a member of your task force? Who was yeah. the yes. task force? There he is. Okay. Hello. Um, he seemed to indicate, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, that that was the first time he had heard Dr. Bernstein make such a suggestion. So I'd like to hear from the group over the course of the last year or whatever length of time that you've been together, two things. What, what other experts did you consult with other than Dr. Bernstein? And secondly, was it always just assumed by everybody in your discussions that this would be a full-time position, or was there any discussion about other ways in order to fill these responsibilities? I can like just start with a quick answer that the, the, the concept really came to us from Dr. Bernstein. Mm -hmm. uh, when he spoke last week, he had not told us that he thought it could be anything less than that. Than a full-time uh, position. But what we had him do is vet the job description and perhaps upon vetting the job description, and he has worked a fair amount with the schools. He's come to the conclusion that if you had the right person with the right training, it doesn't have to be a full-time position. And again, we're not wedded to spending more money. We are wedded to providing the task. We would be very concerned if this person couldn't spend the half of their time on this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the parts of the job description that I would like you to bear in mind is this is the World Security Task Force. It's not the Wilton School System right. Task Force. We have Fatima, we have other schools, and we would like this person to at least be able to advise them on those kinds of issues. We have to have a, a town response, if you will. I don't think it's going to take a tremendous amount of their time, but certainly we would we would want to make any resources we have in the time uh, in the town relative to uh, safety and security available to all the citizens in the town. You know, I think what's important to understand is um, my discussion with Dr. Bernstein, at least, and I've spoken to Mr. Clark about it also. If you had someone who was dedicated and their position was, say, expanded to do this, and they spent a, a portion of their time doing the threat assessing, we, you're, we're always going to have to look at it. Is it enough? And it may be a year or two years from now or eight months from now, we're going to say, it's, it's a full-time position. It's definitely a full-time position, and we've got to now budget for it and figure out a way to make it work because it's critical to, the, to everybody's safety. You might, or you might turn around and say, you know what, having someone who's expanded their abilities, they've gotten certifications, whatever is needed to do threat assessing, and they've got enough time to do it, and their workload allows them to do it adequately. And we'd have to hear from that person and maybe do some type of a baseline study where going in, this is where we are, and a year from now, we look at how much workload there was or isn't, and then we decide where to go from there. You'll always be evaluating it, just like right. you would do with any staff position. He made the point to us that Wilton, on average, sees two to four escalated threat cases during the course of a year, which, in his opinion, he said he was very comfortable with us going with a hybrid position on this. Yeah. But I think what the position really needs to also look at, the threats, I, I, what you just said is probably very accurate. However, I think that person should be involved in um, looking at all the bullying cases, because I'm sure you've got many more than that, many more 
issues mm -hmm. with social oh, media yeah. and all yeah. sorts of things that are going on um, in the middle school and the high school. That if you have somebody as a position, as a threat assessor like this, has an overview of really what's going on and then sees the red flags that are coming up that we don't miss and that's part of the whole assessment program um, that he taught the faculty was part of bringing things to light to somebody as a focal point now to sit and look okay there's a couple of red flags here instead of one person knowing about it not communicating with somebody you've got that focal point and okay let's maybe we need to bring somebody in and talk with them and assess what's going on and that was actually another point he made in favor of going with the hybrid by using yeah. somebody already on the staff you've already got somebody who's those eyes and ears sure. on around the ground and is in touch with with what's going on and, and again we have nothing it's at long but and I understand you, just, your you know, board everyone like, wants to get it right your board right. like my board has been under intense pressure from the board of finance and the taxpayers <laughs> will in fairness to cut 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 um, I'm not sure that I want to say to you, oh yeah, I'm sure you have somebody who doesn't have enough responsibilities right now. Yeah. And I don't know where you lay them off. I, right. That's beyond our pay grade, guys. Would that be a better solution than hiring somebody new? Absolutely. If we have somebody that's already known to us. Would that person have any training as a forensic psychologist? No, I don't think you have anybody in your staff like that. But could they learn? Could we put a hybrid position in and put some money in so that Dr. Bernstein or someone else who do some training. That's exactly mm -hmm. what we did, Al. That was part of the proposal was to put extra money into the budget for uh, for Dr. Bernstein to be used as a resource. But see, that assumes it's that it's a training yeah. resource, yeah. not not somebody when you have somebody identified bringing in. This both. is not a this. It was it was actually both. It was. Both. It, that's, that's it, so this is those this resources is it's okay. If this is new information for you. This was a, a development literally in our last meeting. We we talked that through as a possibility. And we haven't decided on it because that's what we're here to do today. Yeah. But if it was a full-time position and you posted it, that doesn't necessarily assume it's going to be an outside hire. You know, so it could be somebody who's already quite familiar with the staff, who then receives extra training and Absolutely. education and whatever. Right. But it could still be a full-time right. position, but be a full-time hire, and then that person's right. position. Right. I guess that they I just vacate reflected that you're under the same headcount. Yeah constraints that everybody has. Without question. Yeah, sure. so, Without question. You know, I know. And I mean, sure. we were happy to be adding the school resource officer. It's just such a big nut to swallow in one year. You know, in a perfect world, of course, we'd hire two threat assessment coordinators. But we're just trying to make sure we get it, you know, to, to do it right. Sure. Right. So to back right. to my question, though, what other experts did you consult and uh, or was Dr. Bernstein? He was the primary basic, one. Okay. There are not that many experts out there, frankly. Okay. But what we did do is we read um, every time there's an incident, the sneak, uh, Secret Service, the FBI, a whole variety of companies write detailed reports of what happened. And those were all reviewed. Um, you had members on your task force as well that had, uh, in addition to uh, the chief, that have. Uh, security uh, backgrounds. Oh, so absolutely. Yeah. You know, Terry Schwartz is uh, FBI and a former executive with New York State Homeland Security. Uh, Jack Succi is 25 or 30 years in law enforcement and has some significant contacts at the state. Uh, John Logan, who cannot be here uh, with us tonight, is one of the security senior security people for the United Nations. Um, when he misses meetings, it's because he's in Mogadishu trying to protect people. Yeah. So. Um, his claim to fame, if you will, is one of his first jobs was when there was the mass killing going on in Uganda and you had two tribes. The United Nations was trying to protect one and keep the others out. He said, we have 400,000 people in the tent city and we had 400,000 people on the outside trying to kill them and we had blue helmets. My job was to make sure that we provided security. So he has some interesting insights in that. And we have Rose Andy Simone who deals with a lot of the students here in uh, and has for many years uh, that are in the high school, uh, and, and we did uh, a fair amount of research as to how you know, was there an increased problem going on, and if you measure things like the number of meltdowns and so on and so forth, sadly there is. Right. We all know how much stress our kids are under, right. uh, and it, it's bound to be there. And thank God no one's broken. But six weeks right. before. 
six weeks before the uh, Sandy Hook, we remember that a boy who had been at this school walked through the woods, 26 years old, and, and lunched his father to death. One of the problems we're all facing as a society is we have a huge mental health crisis and we have in many ways dismantled our mental health infrastructure. It's a terrible thing for us to have to deal with, but I, I think we do have to realize we are in a different world. And first of all, any government security? I'd like to add on that. Um, with my medical background and my subspecialty is mental health. I do a big search in regard to um, what a forensic psychologist should look like. Um, I have many colleagues who are in the field and I ask them what would be the appropriate person coming into a school setting. And I think we need to be careful too, and, and I understand being a taxpayer, being a, mem a, a Wilton com a community member here for 24 years, I think we need to, to look at the position per se and look at the educational background. Um, I do work in, this, in the Wilton School District, I'm proud of it, and I'm very um, proud to be with my esteemed colleagues. But the training and the expertise in a, is in a certain venue. When you're talking forensic psychology, you're talking clinical. You're talking someone in a forensic facility where there is training, there is um, profiling, there's a lot of stuff going on. And that's my fear, and I, I had a conversation with Dr. Richards and some other members of, this, of the team here. and and the administration, and I analogized it to, you know, if you have a, an issue, a brain tumor, you've been diagnosed with a brain tumor, you have a surgeon and you have a neurosurgeon, who are you going to go to? Both of them can do surgery, but you're actually going to go to that neurosurgeon, I would hope, because he has the expertise. So if we have, you know, a psychologist, and I'm just pointing this out, you have a psychologist and you have a forensic psychologist, and we have issues with forensics here, who are you going to go to? That psychologist is very well trained and highly respected, but that other person has that, that oomph. We have students in our district, as in every district I think across the nation, that we need to look at. Um, as Hal said, the amount of stress, the amount of baggage that these students bring into the classroom is phenomenal. I've been in this business a long time and I haven't seen the profile that I'm seeing now. And Dr. Richards and I even discussed that. We had children going in simultaneously in the school. And um, we need to start tracking them from kindergarten. We need to start tra tracking them perhaps from preschool and getting them and tracking them up into the high school. This individual would be that person who would have that expertise to put it on the grid. The kids who are under the radar. The kids on the radar we know and we can deal and we can assess them. The kids who are under the radar are the ones that concern me and we're not picking them up, and not by lack of, just because we're not seeing them, we don't have the time to dig a little deeper. And also then, once it's identified, we need somebody who's going to put it together, give us strategies in the classroom. How do you deal with this child in the classroom? Strategies to the parents. How do you deal with this child in your home? Perhaps even strategies to the community, if need be. So we need someone who has that expertise to pull it all together, to make it work, and to keep an eye on it on an even keel. And I, I, I really feel very strongly about that. If we're going to do it as Wilton Public Schools, let's do it right. Roseanne, what's an example of a student who could be under the radar who the forensic psychologist would be able to pick up who our normal staff, or existing staff wouldn't do? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of that. The example of somebody under the radar you're talking okay. about. Okay, I'll give you an example of a student that um, this was exemplified the other day in, in the classroom. Um, this individual, the student, uh, has been in multiple situations where there have been disciplinary action. Um, there is a behavioral problem with the student. Some days he's good, some days he's not. He came into the classroom, my classroom in particular. Um, he was called down on a certain thing because he was doing something wrong. So he was not disciplined, but he was told, you need to correct it. He totally went ballistic. He took somebody else's backpack flung it. He um, took the chair, kicked it across the room, and I'm standing there with 27 other students in the room. Thank, you know, thank goodness I know what to do, and I calmed down the situation. If it wasn't, and I'm, again, I'm not saying that my colleagues are not prepared, they are. I come from a different background, okay. Um, this is a, a child that I brought to administration and said, I think we need to look at this child because there's, it's deeper than what we see here. Something else is going on. He also wrote something on a paper that I had given him. 
and seeing the writing come back concerned me. It was a red flag. So it was brought to administration and there were multiple things going on. It, there are some things that I cannot express you know, here via confidentiality. This student is still in the school. I don't know the intervention that's going on at this point. Um, that's my, those, those are the type of students that you see them once, it happens. Perhaps other times they're pretty calm. Maybe another meltdown in another situation versus some of our students who are constantly in, in turmoil. And it is happening more and more. It is societal. Honest to God, it really is. We're, we're seeing more and more of it. What exactly is the difference? My question is, can we train existing staff to, to get that forensic level? Or is that something that only a degree in forensic psychology gets you? In my, t in my speaking with my colleagues who are in forensics, um, the first thing that they have said to me is this person needs to be clinically trained. They need to have the forensic background. Can Dr. Bernstein do it? Perhaps, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, that, that's not my subspecialty forensics, but all of the people who are there have said they need to be trained clinically. They need to have that background experience. Um, I don't know what this training program is, so I really can't respond properly to it. You know, he may have a, an unbelievable program. It may be, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't answer that question intelligently. All I know is from the experts that I deal with, they emphatically said that this person needs to be trained in forensics if you're going to do it right. And if you're not going to do it right, then, you know, my feeling is, then why do it? Then just use Dr. Bernstein. You know, we have him on board, and, <coughs> and we use him. But once again, finances and availability, and who is going to do that tracking? <coughs> Who's not going to be available to do that tracking from K through 12? There needs to be somebody to put it all together. You know, we can bring pieces in, but somebody's got to put it together. That's a good point. I think that's one of the questions that we discussed briefly at our last meeting, and I've been thinking about since then, which is there's there's both a uh, an evaluation process and a tracking process that needs to happen through here, and you know. I don't know, but it, but I wonder if when the evaluation needs to happen, if that could be a time that we could, if we had somebody that were a threat uh, assessment coordinator that wasn't clinically trained as a forensic psychologist, if we could bring in somebody like a Dr. Bernstein to do the evaluation while the person on staff does the tracking and monitoring and management of the overall <coughs> program. Just a, just a question. And it, it might, I mean, one of the things that this role needs to do is to educate, you know, their fellow colleagues, right. educate the students and the parents how to deal with this, educate the community so we raise the awareness of it. And it's going to be a see something, say something kind of environment. Um, certainly when it gets down to a crisis and you know you've got something that just has to be dealt with, you, it might be possible that this person can do those other things. And some of the training, we've all been through some of the training. Um, you do need, probably can be handled somebody other than Dr. Bernstein. And you use Dr. Bernstein mm -hmm. when you say, oh, <laughs> what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. But what, he, what you're going to do now is you're going to lay out a program with that child. Somebody's going to make sure that child program is followed. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to try to see other problems that are, that are involved. Uh, out there, there may be may be causing this. And the last thing we want to do is lose any child in the world. Um, and I hate to think that we're not intervening before it becomes a crisis stage. If that forensic psychologist is properly trained and comes in with the clinical expertise, they can do that evaluation. We do not have to go on the outside. Right. It can be done in house, right. and then the strategization can be done after that also. So. The Dr. Bernstein, I would think, is when we're all hitting the wall saying, okay, what do we do, right, what do, we do now? We're, we're really stuck. He's the guru of, so he would be somebody that we would tap in in that, that position. But we would not have to do it, you know, on a continual basis if we had the right person in the position. He, he did tell me today that he could train present staff to do that. Okay. Jory, your thoughts, comments? You're, you're at the front lines. <laughs> <laughs> in the trenches. I'm in, uh, admittedly, a rather uncomfortable position, and, and I say that from a perspective of being on this committee, but then also being a school administrator, who, along with a 
a lot of very bright people in the room helped build this budget. And Today you're speaking to us as a member of the committee, though. I understand that, but I'm still Jory, who's who's that person. And yeah. and I think that there's a reality that that we're all faced with, not only from a, a board perspective, but as an administrative team and a, a member of this committee, to try to balance all of these these concerns. And uh, if if you're asking me if I think we need more mental health support, you know, you can talk to my partner, uh, fantastic director, Ann Paul, and uh, she would certainly support that that thinking and logic, but at some point, money matters, and it, when you start to measure the bigger picture of how does it fit in and how do we make it all work, it's, you've got to look at everything, you're not looking at just right. the particular. So, um, with with that in mind, it's, it's hard for me to know uh, to try to quantify it. When we say it's only maybe two or four, I think Dr. Bernstein is the, the number that he came up with in the last couple of years for us. But then how many more were were other children that would have been on the docket because there were other issues at play? Maybe not uh, uh, a threat to others, but perhaps a threat to themselves. And uh, how much of our present staff deal with that in a um, for lack of a better way of putting it, more of a triage method, having to drop everything else and really uh, bear down for that child. So it's it's a very difficult spot to know what the right answer for this is in terms of how we, we manage the decision and whether or not this is a, um, a financial decision you make to say that, you know, already we're 700,000 or so in the hole from what we really believed we needed in the budget, and now we're being told that you know, perhaps this is another gap that we're going to have to now try to fill in somewhere else. That's a that's a tough pill to swallow, even as a school administrator. Were there key Were there key learnings that uh, that you had through this process? Were there things that that uh, well, maybe surprised is the wrong word, but that uh, you you didn't know coming into this process that uh, you might like to share? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, I'm not hunting for a specific answer. I'm, I'm, I respect your position as a, as a dean. Um, I know you're on the front lines, but you've now been asked to participate in this task force mm -hmm. and look at the world from a slightly different perspective. Mm -hmm. this different perspective. What were some of the uh, enlightenments that you might have had through that process? If there were any. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure really what you're getting at. I'm not sure what the, the question oh, is, but I... Yeah. Bruce is asking, has being on the task force changed anything that you thought or believed or practiced before you were on the task force? Like, great you've way been of, a school Great way of putting it. No. Okay. No. I, you know, I, I'm a big believer in uh, anybody who's had parents come through the system and have heard me speak every year to parents. I'm always talking about it parents trying to encourage their children to find an adult that they can trust and someone they can go to. And Dr. Bernstein talks uh, quite a bit about uh, how important it is to make those personal connections with children. So I think if, if nothing else, it reinforced, I think, a message we try to convey year in and year out, not just me, but all of us try to, and that uh, the more opportunity to make those connections, the more likely that there will be the leakage that Dr. Bernstein talks about that if there is a rumor mill or if someone's talking about something that an adult will be notified and something happens. So in that regard, I would say, it, to, to many ways, it reinforced that, that thinking. You know, Dr. Bernstein talks about the black swan events and that, uh, you know, the hope would be that if you've made, if you've done the work of establishing an environment where children know that there are adults that they can go to to trust, that hopefully you're aware of what's going on ahead of time and can prevent the event right what and we've heard that this position is uh, not a desk position but a community position so the person needs to be out in the schools um, do you have any concerns or perspectives that you can share with us about uh, what it would be like for a middle schooler to be known as having had a conversation with a threat assessment coordinator you know, I, that I could see that being concerning in a lot of ways, not only for the child, but also for the child's parents, um, for all of the kids around them. Um, maybe we don't call it a threat assessment coordinator, I don't know. But. We played with the name of cultural 
school of culture. Um, frankly, the threat assessment coordinator is more because we have to explain to the town what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Would you come up with a more positive name? Absolutely, for exactly those reasons. Yeah. But I, I would agree with you that that's, that's very much a sensitive issue that we would have to think about. Uh, you know, who is this person that so-and-so is going to see, and then how do you justify that for them and their family, and how do they feel about going to see that person? Uh, I think we have that same issue at times for, for going to see a counselor or a senior psychologist or senior Right. right. So <laughs> time, <laughs> that makes sense. Those things happen. So, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a, if you put yourself in a spot where that's right. who you need to go see, well, too bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair answer. Do you have thoughts? Um, I'm not an educator. I have no, you know, professional training in that regard, so I can't really speak to whether or not somebody on staff would eventually have the acumen to do this. And I think that I would have to agree with Roseanne that it does take a specific set skill set to really do the job professionally and well. And I think that the problem is the gap period between training up with somebody who's on staff and getting them up to speed on the credentials that are necessary to do the job to its fullest. Um, I think that that gap is a problem. And I think the money that you're going to be spending on Dr. Bernstein or anybody else to do training and for the person to attend training is a financial commitment as well that maybe is, in a way, money not well spent if you look at just hiring somebody and taking the money and putting it towards that. And I think that if you're going to rely on statistics that have happened based on what has happened, I think that's naive as well because the statistics of two to four could change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah in such great number. You know, we've seen it just the other day with the stabbing of the girl in Milford. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's random events. You're not exactly sure what's going to trigger people to that kind of random and volatile and bizarre behaviors. And I think that, unfortunately, as we all, I think, agree that the um, landscape that we now li you know, are living in is quite different than a couple of years ago or 10 years ago um, or it could be yesterday and all of a sudden you know you could start seeing things happening in a very rapid uh, progression and I, I personally don't think that somebody who has myriad other things to do would be able to keep up with the, the pace if the pace changed there's no way to predict that with any credibility, but if you just look at what's going on in the world, you might, you know, as we all said, it can happen here, it certainly could. And I think that like the having an additional uh, SRO who can have a very um, affable relationship with the kids, That's true. the threat assessment person hopefully would establish equally as affable relationship. And I think that that in itself would bring forward concerns either about others or about themselves to that person once that person is identified. And I think that it would have to be somebody who's unique and special. It's just my, you know, not being an administrator or an educator my security professional right. opinion right. that there would be less of an opportunity for things to go through the cracks, more of an opportunity for somebody to spend more time, adequate time, and um, credible time dealing with it. I think we also look at critical incidences. We look at the, the traumatic pieces that happen. Sometimes we forego the preventative piece, and I think that is huge. If this person can come in and start doing some tracking or some assessments or some visualization, um, branching out into each school in the district, 
and start doing some prevention, perhaps that can also be a fort. We're never going to not have anything happen. Something can happen at any time. We can't guarantee it's not going to happen. But if we can put all of our resources into something that perhaps we can identify, we can react to, we can put a plan into place, we've done our job. We've done our job. And if, God forbid, anything ever happens to the other end of the trauma, we deal with that too. That's, what, that's the kind of district we are. We all rally together and deal with it. But I think this, this individual will have the capability because everybody is stressed to the max. We are all working every single hour of the day doing what we need to do, and then some, because of the amount of students that are coming through the doors. So I think you know having a hybrid is great on paper, but perhaps in facilitation it's just not going to work because that person's going to be dealing with a PPT or a situation where there's a meltdown somewhere else in their other responsibilities, and then all of a sudden somebody's coming in saying, hey look, you know, I've got this red flag, I don't know what to do. Okay, I'll deal with it when I'm finished with this critical incident here. How do you prioritize? It's, it's difficult. You bring up an interesting question about the PPT. Um, let's say it was a full-time position, threat assessment coordinator. Um, and I guess the question would be back to Ann. Um, would we see this individual potentially participating in IEPs or PPTs you know, based on difficult situations? I mean, is there a scenario where that could conceivably happen? You're leading the wrong way. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you and Roseanne are leading the news. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> this way. Okay. It certainly could happen, but I think it would be very limited because the threat assessment coordinator would be dealing with a very limited number of cases. So okay. I think that would be a very small portion of the time. Uh, Dr. Bernstein told us that in low risk districts, which he categorized well as low risk, he said pretty much every school had a hybrid. He wasn't aware really of anybody in our area who has a full time threat assessment coordinator. Do you happen to know if anyone has changed that this year or if there's a, a trend, if things are changing? Not that we want to follow, but just curious. No, Chris, I gotta tell you one of the great disappointments is there is very little information. Yeah. It's new. About anybody yeah. doing it. It's, it's it's too new. It's, new. Yeah. it's too new. Okay. The little I've heard, I think we're doing as much or more than, than other communities. And there were some, I'm sorry, when, it, when we first had the crisis last year, the sub towns reacted by just writing checks. You know, Westport paid $150,000 or something for a study. I have no idea what they oh. did with that study. <laughs> uh, Ridge, Ridgefield, I think, hired three SROs yeah. instantly. Mm -hmm. um, Reading you know, yeah, did that too. Reading did it. Reading okay. did it. it, it People want to react to it. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're trying to do is think our way through this problem okay. because mm -hmm. it's very hard once you build up a staff, to be mm -hmm. honest with it, to reduce that staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we should any any addition should be considered very carefully. Again, but perhaps the answer is I know from the special group had in Germany and how much time people like Jory spend um, dealing with bullying issues. If he had a resource he could call on that could take some of that burden, how much burden have we put on the existing mm -hmm. staff now with things that this person could take on? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know the way the schools work well enough to do that, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that certainly is a, I mean, we've talked enough of them. All of us have enough friends who are, who are teachers um, or married to them that uh, we're aware of them. The huge number of things that are asked to do now that they were not asked to do some years ago. And some of these hopefully can be taken off and then assumed by this by this role. Mm -hmm. Ken, not to put you on the spot, uh, but I'm going to, I guess. <laughs> do you know uh, roughly how many mental health professionals we have on our payroll? Bodies, heartbeats. I believe we have around, and Ann, you can correct me if I'm wrong, nine or ten psychologists and for social workers, I believe. And that's that across the district. Yeah. Okay, and of those, of those nine to ten heartbeats, uh, how many of those are full-time employees, and how many of those are uh, some portion of? The majority are full-time. Are there are there a couple that aren't? 
There are a couple that are just shy, okay. like a point eight. Does anyone have the type of clinical training we were talking about? Well, many of our um, psychologists and social workers came out of a clinical background. They have very strong clinical training in child guidance clinics and hospital settings before they came to work in the schools. So quite a few of our um, mental health professionals have very strong clinical backgrounds. The reason that I'm, I asked the question is if perchance we decided that uh, we wanted to and I'm not throwing this out as a proposal, I'm just brainstorming. Uh, we decided we wanted to try the uh, threat assessment coordinator uh, on a part-time basis, and we found somebody internally that, that met those needs but had other job responsibilities. I wanted to know if we could offload some of those job responsibilities to other people already in the district without having to add additional heartbeats. So that's why I was asking the question. Um, Chris, questions? Oh, well, I guess maybe one. Is this task force um, well versed in the proposal that the administration proffered last week? Do you all understand the administration's proposal, the so called hybrid approval? Only as it was reported in the press. Maybe the administration could spend a couple of minutes making sure the task force understands it. Sure. I think that's a good idea. Ken, can you walk through that, please? Sure. The, uh, we brought Dr. Bernstein in and, and uh, walk through some of the data and uh, talk about how we could make this work at a um, scaled down level instead of a full-time person. And the proposal we came up with was to um, do it at the level of like an instructional leader stipend, um, which in this case was about $15,700. Um, so it would be an add-on to a person's existing job. Um, and we agreed with him because he made the point that if we're doing that, it has to be somebody with the right skill sets. Like we we're talking about, they don't necessarily need to be um, certified as a forensic psychologist. Um, and part of the plan was that we find the person with the right qualities, we put some money in the budget for Dr. Bernstein to train this person, and also to have Dr. Bernstein as the resource to come in if we need to have somebody do actually do a forensic evaluation. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons, or some of the reasons why he was uh, okay with this whole plan was, um, for one thing, bless you, our, our commitment to, to honoring the spirit of the, the job description, the fact that we did have all of the training for all of the middle and high school students, staff, including bus drivers, parents, um, <clears throat> uh, we had all the training and, and just our general commitment to making this work. And, uh, and the low risk of the district, and we felt all of these factors combined, um, we could make that work. Obviously, like uh, to your point before, Chief, if we start going through here the year and realize that it's bigger than that, uh, you know, we either have to find money to do something different or, or incorporate something into the budget for the following year. Because I think you're right, it will, you know, as things change, it probably will grow into something larger as the years go by. But uh, we. Chuck and myself and, and Dr. Bernstein felt that this was a, a workable solution for this uh, for first year. Questions on that proposal? I don't have any idea how to relate that to what percentage of their daily jobs in the mm -hmm. It sounds like about 20%. Or, or probably between 10 and 20%. Yeah. I think that's a, a challenge for somebody who doesn't possess the skills that were defined as needed for a district that has 46 or 4,700 kids. Um, it, in, in listening to your team, my personal opinion is you might be right. I mean, it, it sounds like there's potentially more there. Um, that's, I mean, we're going to deliberate on this. Learn thoughts, comments, questions? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's hard because obviously um, school security is defined, you know, in terms of school violence is something no one wants to see. But I also think no one wants to see any child die or any young adult die. And I'm speaking of um, my son, Jason, graduated five years ago, and two of his classmates died of drug overdoses while in college. Others had drug overdoses that didn't lead to death. I mean, those were serious problems they had in high school that they carried forth. And so, how do, I mean, that's, it's, we need to achieve the balance of, you know, taking care of all 
the problems, all the dangers to our children. It's not just, um, and so it's kind of just a very complicated and um, complex test that our school employees face every day, and as do our students and our children. And I don't think anyone wants to put anyone in danger. Um, it seems a little hard that we're put in a position of if we cut this full-time position, we're not doing everything we can to protect our children. I mean, it's just, we're, I mean, I think we all want to protect our children all the time. And that, that's all. I, you know, I do not, I don't envy you these decisions and the board is selecting if we cut something that's usually bricks and mortar. No, I um, know it's And yeah. the worst thing that happens is we have to buy a truck earlier kind of thing. Yeah. It doesn't, with, with you, if, if we get it wrong, there could be horrible consequences. Yeah, it's, uh, we can't spend our budget dollars twice. So, you know, right. we, we weigh this against uh, teaching, to be very honest. Sure. Well, the town's in the same position. Where you have to cut, you have to do a big cut. Do you cut a firefighter? Do you cut a police officer? I mean, it's not. It's always. It can be the same. Yeah, yeah. It can be. It can be. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, can I just add sure. one more thing about the responsibilities? From a security point of view, working with Homeland Security and the FBI, every time there was an incident anywhere, we all looked at it intensely. People would go be dispatched by the departments to the locale where the incident occurred. I'm sure the chief has done this mm -hmm. Newtown and other places. Mm -hmm. So I would hope that it would be taken into consideration that whoever had this position and if it were somebody who's already on staff is allowed the flexibility to spend the time doing things like that because there's so much that we learn from That's things correct. that have occurred and if it is somebody on staff who's got other responsibilities that flexibility may not be there so. and this has to be somebody that to some extent becomes passionate about learning what others are doing what has happened right um, you know this isn't a it's not like we can go to a college and they're putting these people out because somebody wrote their textbook. What do you do next? You have to have somebody that has a lot of initiative and a lot of curiosity and a lot of passion about getting the job right. I, again, speaking personally, I, I feel as though our, our decision were more difficult would be more difficult if we didn't have Dr. Bernstein available to us. Um, and in some respects, maybe the decision would be a lot easier, too, because without having him available, we'd have no choice but to, to, to jump in and, and, and put a body in that doesn't exist. Um, I'm going to put the question out to the board for us to deliberate on for a bit. I'd like you folks to stay here because if, as we deliberate, if we have questions, I'd like to ask, ask you. But it, it seems to me we, we have three decision points here. Uh, moving forward with the threat assessment coordinator because we all agree that we want somebody to do threat assessment coordination. The question is, um, do we give guidance to the administration to move forward with our current proposal, which is a stipended position? Do we uh, recommend to them that they make it a full-time, 40-hour-a-week uh, position, 2,000 hours a year? Or do we do uh, some sort of hybrid of their hybrid and recommend that they fund this position at some level greater than what they've recommended at the stipended level. Um, and I'd like to hear from each of you on, on your thoughts on that. Start with you, Chris. So I would uh, I'd endorse the uh, administration's current proposal. Uh, and uh, every quarter, ask the administration after consultation with the security task force to reassess and recognize that um, additional information and analysis will lead us, you know, potentially to different conclusions. But based on what I've heard, I'd accept the administration's proposal as presented and reassess periodically. Okay. Mark? Um, um, I, I think I agree with this. <laughs> I give it all my job to that. Um, should I read Glenn's? Yeah, please. Um, as you, everybody knows, Glenn Hemmerly couldn't be here this evening. He's been actively involved in your task force activities, um, and he's written a statement because he couldn't be here. 
Oh, because I, I do like the idea of, like, I mean, we would constantly assess anything anyway, but just the sense that whatever decision we make tonight is going to be evaluated, that we're not, it's not a final decision. So if we went it's with not a the administra decision. administration's proposal, mm -hmm. it could be changed in the future and something to think about before we need <coughs> Okay, so this is from Glenn Hammerly. Unfor um, unfortunately, I can't be presented at tonight's meeting, so I'm writing to have my views and commentary read into the record. First, as a member of the Security Task Force, I can assure everyone that the proposals and recommendations made by the Task for Force were in each and every case thoroughly discussed, researched, and put forth as reasonable steps to help ensure the safety and well-being of Wilton schools, students, and staff. These recommendations were unanimously adopted by the Board of Ed and, where necessary, included in the budget for the coming year. It was only when the Board of Finance requested a reduction in the almost $80 million budget did the administration change its position and see the opportunity to reduce the budget by the amount set aside for the position of threat assessor. The comment was made at a recent Board of Ed meeting when the budget was under discussion that we don't need to pay someone $85,000 a year to sit around and wait for something to happen. A troubling view, to say the least, if this is how the position was defined by the administration. Also troubling to me is the change in position by Dr. Bernstein from his original input. Yes, it is reassuring and comforting to know that we can think of ourselves as a low-risk community. Sadly, I'm sure the same could be said about Milford. Just so there is no misunderstanding, the addition of this role in our school system is no absolute guarantee that we will never have an issue of significant consequence that I have to accept, but I am committed to doing all that we can that is reasonable and prudent to help prevent or offset a sad event. In closing, I am painfully reminded of a comment made to me by Dr. Richards during my board orientation. Dr. Richards said that in all of his years as an educator, he has never seen the pressure our students are under or the anxiety they are feeling so high, and it is only growing year by year. Yes, the world is changing, and these issues cannot be reasonably addressed by someone who doesn't have this objective as their full-time responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we try to be very objective in our roles here as board members in many of our decisions, but this is one topic that I find it uh, difficult, if not impossible to be objective. I'm extremely subjective as my children attend these schools. So um, I have always been in favor of this position being a full-time job. I have never wavered from that uh, position. And if anything, tonight's discussion makes me even more firmly um, planted in that position. I feel that it is not a question of hybrid or full-time. It is a the question before us is either you do it or you don't do it. And if you're going to do it, you do it right. And you don't play games. And that's my position. And so I would fully support doing it full time. I'm absolutely convinced it is not only a full time position, but maybe even above and beyond a full time position. Um, and from the suggested cuts in order to potentially fill this as a full-time position. Uh, none of them amaze me or alarm me in any way, and I think it's a budget that can support this position, and so therefore I'm in full support of going forward with this position as a full-time job. Or we don't do it at all until we're ready to do it right. Because I don't, I think, I can't imagine anybody on our staff being able to do this job with the current responsibilities. And I think we'd just be backfilling their position. So I think if we're gonna do it, we do it right. That's my position. Thank you. Chris? I came into this meeting tonight um, very persuaded by what Dr. Bernstein told us last week about the fact that, in his opinion, this did not need to be a full-time position. Um, I've changed my thinking. Um, I think it needs to be a full-time position. I've been persuaded by our um, faculty and by our you know, people who, who live this every day. So thank you for your work, and I think this needs to be a full time position. I do think that it's incorrect that the student resource officer is being funded out of the Board of Education for the record, but um, thank you. <laughs> you I didn't think that was going to go that way. <laughs> I have, you never uh, cease to 
shock you. <laughs> well, you know what? This this is a this is a perfect example of of this board working really well. Uh, we had you come in this evening uh, at Chris's recommendation. Um, I was ready to vote a week ago to go with the administration's recommendation. Um, in listening to the discussion this evening, um, I shifted to thinking 10 to 20 percent wasn't enough. Um, yet in corporate America, when we when we wrestle with headcount, um, we oftentimes look at uh, bringing people in on a contract basis um, so that we can uh, address our headcount concerns while we try to feel out uh, what the true need is. Um, in a perfect world, I would support a contracted full-time position for one year. Um, I don't know how the board feels about that. Well, what do you mean by that? You could explain that. I mean somebody who's under contract for one year. So it's not a full-time employee of the Wilton right. School District? Not for the first year, as we figure well, out. Well, I think then you're not really making a commitment to the position. You want somebody who's going to start building the trust and... The challenge, the challenge that I have is there's a lot of unknown. There's a lot of unknown. How is this position going to interact not only with children, but with the staff, with parents, uh, with the special education process? There's just a tremendous amount of unknown on my part. But to that point, Laura had said that um, this, we're making this decision for the year coming and that things can change. We're still an employer. Yes. And Ken um, would Sure. I think if we have somebody coming in full time working under our direction, um, I believe that the IRS or Department of Labor would classify them as an employee as opposed to just bringing in like a Dr. Bernstein to come in and do his thing as an evaluation or a training piece that he does a lot of other places. If you have somebody who's working exclusively for you under your direction, true, but it's classified as an employee. Well, but they're still technically also under a one-year contract, right? Which may or may not get renewed. Um, but we have to treat them as an employee. Okay, that, that's not clear. I think actually, I think Bruce's point. I I don't, I don't think so. I, my last experience using uh, contractors that work as part of teams under the direction of management for extended periods of time, and that we don't want to follow of IRS regulations. Yeah. But we can investigate that another time, but I think it's a worthy idea to consider whether rather than adding a, per a permanent full-time staff, whether it's some, you know, expert that can help us better define the roles and the responsibilities, build out the position description, answer some of the unknown questions. I don't know whether it's, you know, 2,000 hours, 1,000 hours, it's some amount of time that gives us the benefit then of assessing uh, based on the results of a professional what we really need as opposed to uh, making a decision to either endorse a hybrid approach or uh, to hire a full-time uh, person today. So your, your compromise position, your hybrid uh, recommendation would be one I would support. And I don't think we'd have to decide today whether we're hiring 1,000 hours of contract services or 2,000, or I think that can be decided over time. But we should, pro if if that were the case, we we'd probably need to give the administration direction yeah. on funding it at that level. That's right. So, would either of you support that? Would you f fund it at the equivalency of a full time position? I would think you'd have to. Yeah. So how would that affect? So how would that be different than? I don't, I'm not really catching. Because it gives us some flexibility. It's I understand that, that, that person oh. knows that they could be laid off at the end of the year, is that the only difference? We would also have to not have to outlay for the benefits if we were doing a contract. Yeah, and just to be That's clear, since I rec my recommendation right. was to accept the administration's recommendation right. and the administration after consultation with Dr. Bernstein in some detailed consultation decided that it did not require a full-time job, I would be supportive of your approach at a level of effort that was well below full time. Okay. So I would not, I would not support that. 
<laughs> you're going to do it, it's a full-time job. As I, said I could support a full-time equivalency contract employee, bring someone in full-time. Full again, you would save the benefit. You wouldn't have to do benefits, right? Right. And we don't, add our, so we don't increase our headcount. Right. one. <laughs> Aren't our employees <laughs> under contract? I mean, it so. Yeah, yeah they hired a full-time person. Won't that person have a contract? With their contracts with the schools. Well, who would the contract be with? I don't, I don't no, I meant like when we hire a teacher. teacher that's a contract. The teacher has a contract. Well, I don't think you're going to structure this as a consulting position. That's yeah, one way of doing one. it, and that's what I understood it to be. Uh, I think one of the issues when you're, and if you do, if you decide that you're going to, I don't know how you find someone who's willing to take on mm -hmm. essentially a full-time job um, with mm -hmm. some of the... Yeah. Um, uncertainties about what this job is really about, and I, I think that that's a little bit. I don't know who would take such a job, whether you know, and I think it's easy to say, well, we wouldn't do you know benefits for this person, but if somebody taking on a full time job, I would imagine would be expecting that that would be part of a, of a package that they would have uh, as part of their employment. I don't know if there are people that are, if you did an up to you know, $25,000 consultancy, that's a different matter with regards to benefits. So it's, it's just that there are various ways of structuring it, I think, depending on the level of, of investment that we want to make in this. Thoughts, comments? I, you know, I wonder if there is a forensic consultant with this kind of background that is available to be available to do it for me. I have no idea. Um, and we don't know what the market is. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean that's that that would be the challenge to me. I think you can find someone that has that training, um, but are the you know generally a lot of consultants of people have done it elsewhere for a long period of time. In school, ideally, when in the schools. Well, based on that, that experience to us, but based on that question, do we even know that the funding that's put forth is going to be enough to find the person that we want? I mean, we've been throwing around eighty-five thousand dollars a year. Is that a realistic number? It was originally lower, if I recall, mm -hmm. Ken, and then yeah, Ken did it. some yeah. consulting with mm -hmm. Dr. Bernstein, I think, and then that's when they increased it to so. eighty-five. Yeah, I think you would find someone who would have the expertise and the quality with that salary. Is it possible that it would be somebody in private practice today? Probably. Not somebody just out of college. No, somebody no, with absolutely clinical not. experience. Would have, we have somebody who would have a track record. No, it would not be somebody out of college. I think that would be totally inappropriate. But someone who would either be in private practice, who you know, would take this this challenge on and, and do the job properly. I mean, that would have to be a search. You know, based upon everything that I've been told and we've we've talked about over the last year or so for this position, ten or in my opinion, ten to twenty percent of their time is not going to. It's not going to work. If you even did the hybrid position, you have to also remember if that's 50% of their time and then they're, they're, they're still here involved in the students and, the, and the, the faculty and everything that's going on. So you, I think based on my discussions with some of the people on the security task force who work within the school district, I'm just a little bit miffed at the fact that uh, 10 to 20% would even be considered. It's just. I, I just can't see it. Just yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think there's no way it would only be ten to twenty percent. I, you know, the truth is when Dr. Bernstein said we get two to four incidences, that was alarming to me. I, I was shocked by that. I mean, I mean, to him maybe that's considered low, but to me that was high. And I think about what Roseanne said. Incidences like what she experienced this past week. How many times are things like that? happening. I mean, I think this is somebody who can help with the bullying part of the aspect. I, I think also we've been hearing a lot in the last year uh, through Mrs. Paul about um, the increases of mental health issues at the high school, school avoidance, a lot more use of the school psychologists at the high school. Um, all of this leading to increases in sped spending. So it's, you know, I really think that it's a position that this district can afford when you think about it from that perspective. And do you think, 
you have a fair amount of interaction with mental health professionals. Do you think there's a possibility we could find a contractor that would take this on for a year? I think it would be very challenging. I mean, we mentioned people in private practice. Um, private practices on the whole for competent practitioners are, are booming. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it would um, exactly. be unlikely yeah. that yeah. someone should take uh, that position uh, for a year and suspend their practice. So I think it would, I think it would be um, challenging on a contract basis. And of course, uh, you know, um, uh, the the supervisory aspects come into play with the contract provider as well, who provides the the, the supervision of the building. So. And what's your feeling on um, the ability to uh, perhaps shift workload of staff around such that we could free up 50% of an existing employee's time to do this? Uh, it could be done with an up advance planning. It's, it's challenging. Jury's looking at me like, don't you say yes? I'm getting one of these. Um, right. It, it's I, challenging. I don't, I don't it well, the question would be effectively moving people that aren't aren't at full 1.0 FTE now up to 1.0 so that there's some place to move that workload. Right. Is that if I could just add that uh, the reason some of our people are at lower than the 1.0 is for uh, life choices. They um, have some life situations that okay. don't want the opportunity to work full time. Uh, at this point, those people who have elected full-time, we've been able to bring them up. So I'm not even sure that's a real viable option right now. You know, if I can just say, the, the two to four threats that we were talking about here tonight, it could be six to eight or eight to ten, but it's the one that we don't find or we miss or slips through the cracks, that's the one that... And, and by that, to just um, to, so maybe I have a better comprehension, um, tell me how you're convinced that a full-time coordinator is going to materially change the probability of catching that person as opposed to a part-time coordinator. Or, let me go to the other extreme, because I just, again, to understand it, why do we need just one full-time threat coordinator? Why don't we need one and a half? Well, because you know, here's the situation yeah, I have. Sure. I have. Two meetings. So I have, we have this task force, done a lot of work, consulted with Dr. Bernstein, reaches a conclusion. Dr. Bernstein spends time with the administration, they understand the school system and the people, they reach a different conclusion. And so we have two sets of experts, and the debate is not over whether the services need to be provided, we all agree with that. It's the question in the immediate term whether it has to be, pick a number, 400 hours a year or 1,500. I'm having a devil of a time trying to figure out um, what is appropriate under the circumstances, especially since we've all agreed there's not a lot of empirical data to help us make this decision. So this is a, a new area of security, if you will, and yeah. the communities are wrestling with the rest and are sure. attempting to develop rational approaches. So yeah. I, I could be persuaded that we need half a person, a full person, uh, one and a half person, but the only information I have right now is I have a mm -hmm. talented administration advised by Dr. Bernstein who endorses, the group endorses the hybrid approach and we have a talented task force advised by Dr. Bernstein that <laughs> suggests <laughs> a full-time. to be a common And they both sound to be reasonably good and I, I, I can't, I can't <coughs> help right. but wonder how we are supposed to reach a conclusion on this. But I actually have another Wilton uh, community responsibility that I have to host in five minutes so you're going to have four to vote on this, if that's okay with you. You understand my views on some yes, of the spending choices, if you right. have to get to that point in time. You can, for well, the record, he can speak for me, so you can vote twice if you'd like to. If, if you want me to answer your question before you go, Please. Uh, I'll try to do that. For the last year, the reason why we came up with one position mm -hmm. is similar to how I come up with how many police officers I need. Um, we as a group discussed this for hours we kicked it around and I usually try to get things done a little bit let's move along yeah. okay but then we consulted with Dr. Bernstein then we consulted with um, we read a lot of the things that had already occurred in different communities as someone had said earlier you learn from other experiences um, 
we know Wilton is a low-level risk because that's what we're told and because that's what we hear. But you also have to look at the staffing that you have relative to those risks, relative to the bullying, relative to all the state mandates, which I'm sure they have. They have to report every bullying incident to the state now. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. That's, I understand your question. We try to come to the right balance for the community, for the school system, just like I do for the police department. I could easily say I need 55 people, but I don't because I think where we are now with 44, 45 is the right place to be. But to quantify that you're going to catch every incident that may occur that may hurt people, I, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't be a fool to sit here and do that. It's just, but the more proactive you are, the more you're involved, the more you have more layers, the more trusting relationships that you have with students, whether it's a policeman or a psychologist or a teacher that they trust to go to, the more people that a student has to go to throughout their life in the school system where they trust and they might tell one person that might prevent something that happens, then we've all gone, we've all done our job. And that's, that's the whole point here is that you want to try to build, just like with the SROs, I want to have people that work with the students that build those trusting relationships that are another layer of intervention before something happens. Rich Ross is the school resource officer we have now. And in my opinion, and, and also hearing from faculty within the school system, he's excellent. He's very approachable. He's, he takes his time with people. He's concerning. And, and if I chose someone else to be an SRO, I'm going to try to pick someone who has the same same makeup as him, just like you do with any other position you try I, to fit through. I can probably cut to the chase here, you know, um, and and let you go. I'm gonna I'm gonna fall with a vote for a full time employee, um, and my reasoning is, I believe we need more than ten to twenty percent. Um, I'd be comfortable trying fifty to seventy five percent, but through this discussion, I don't see how we do that with existing staff. I don't see how we do it with a contractor based on what I've learned. So I don't see other, any other way to implement it. And to Lori's point, and I get it, and Chris's point, well, each person's point, how we get it implemented uh, effectively otherwise. So with that uh, motion on the floor, full time employee. Second. Th further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Understood and uh, let the record uh, reflect the fact that uh, you're not opposed to the position. <laughs> Just the <laughs> <laughs> Are you being insecure? I know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We Thank really you appreciate your service. Service. Yes. the opportunity. Yeah. We now have to, uh, Ken, you don't, you don't get to leave. Thank you. I'm not leaving. <laughs> now we have to figure out how to pay for this. Yeah, now we have to figure out how to pay for it. <laughs> Wait, why don't we just transfer to the police department. So you know, I, 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 oh. <laughs> I, I am opposed to the cut of trick on this. I got you on that. Thank you, Dennis. That's easy. Yep. What? I'm on I'm on that. Who's in here? It was me almost. I was shaking. I was talking. I was getting so emotionally scared. So now we know what we need to do. Um, you circulated a proposal to us. Uh, go through it again now, if you would, please. Sure. Um, <clears throat> to add back the full-time threat assessment coordinator and take the uh, IL position out, and adding back the FICA also adds back uh, $75,769 into the budget. Um, I told you last time that we had identified another retiree. Um, that retirement gives us an additional $27,510. So we have that, and whether we do this or not. Uh, we will also reduce the alternative night school staffing. And just to explain what I understand has been done in the past is that they usually staff for two sections uh, right up front, but they don't usually need that until halfway through the year. So we can adjust the, the, the staffing for that. Um, the, the high school will cut 26 curriculum days and we will remove a mobile Chrome card from Middlebrook. Talk to me about those curriculum days, please. Um, it's not something we want to do, but it's something that we feel if the board feels that the threat assessment coordinator is 
important and we need to do it, that's the area that we would recommend cutting. What happens we, during those days? What happens during those days? Generally during the summer is when we develop curriculum. Now it could be in any area. Um, usually what happens is that the high school will propose um, certain projects that need to be done in terms of curriculum improvement. It could be mapping, it could be unit development, it could be development of assessments and things like that. So how many days are left then, or was that all of them? I think it's 150. 150? 150. 150. 150. So, days. so there's still 150 intact? Yeah. Yes. Less 20, and then, okay. And how many are at each of the other schools? I don't have that right. District-wide, we, we have around 500 total. 500 days, yeah. So uh, some of the priorities that we would have done this summer, we would not do. Right. The uh, What were some of the other areas of cuts you considered but decided against in coming up with this list? We had uh, talked about um, FTEs, obviously. The, we still have that point six we had added at the high school. Um, and the uh, fourth grade teacher at uh, Cider Mill, which were a couple of things that were added back last, and uh, felt that these cuts, since we didn't have to go as deep, would be much less disruptive, especially since they've, uh, this late in the, uh, in the year, they've already been working under, the, you know, planning their sectioning and everything based on, uh, on what we have in the budget right now, and these, these cuts would be much less disruptive than cutting. cutting. And what's the cost of those curriculum days? It's $5,844 total. There may be some time, too, that as we close out and close the, the end of the year, there may be some, uh, it's a relatively small amount of money that we can find and do some of that work in June before we close out. So we think that's a reasonable uh, possibility. Um, <coughs> I was saying that there... This is, it's a public it's meeting. A public you're welcome. Meeting. You're you're entitled to hear. You want to sit? Can come sit closer? If you Absolutely like. not. <laughs> <laughs> you can sit in my seat if you'd like. Sit right here. Nice what, what I would say is that five thousand dollars. As we close our books at the end of the year, there may be uh, uh, some money that we generally turn back some money to the town. And in this case, I think if we will. Uh, there's a chance that we would have money to be able to do some of that work. There's uh, a couple of weeks at the end of a couple this of school year. I guess well, we could do some of that nice. work if we um, have the money. That would cover that um, and help ease that. Would it be possible to, uh, you know, looking at our uh, insurance funds, mm -hmm. uh, possible to uh, take a little bit more risk in that area so that we're officially taking the risk there as opposed to cutting those mm -hmm. curriculum days? Would that be something that, that you might be comfortable doing? No, we could. Then I'd, I'd be okay with that because um, it really means all we're cutting is that one one cart. With Speaking of that cart, is this a new initiative or is there already one existing and we're just getting more? We have one now. At yeah, we, we have one now. The one that we purchased now is strictly we purchased strictly for SBAC testing, otherwise we've been testing into June. Okay. Um, but the reason we were purchasing that one is because of the long testing window, we wanted to not disrupt the curriculum activities going on at Middlebrook. I don't know if Myrna wants to add anything. Right. The, well, just to address the testing piece, the, the Chromebooks are being used this year in the Library and Media Center, but the additional cart would enable us to not take the entire Library and Media Center offline for six weeks, which is what we've had to do because we're using the PCs in that space to accommodate all of the test takers. So the, the Chromebooks will enable us to bring the cart to the teams and we can actually open up the Library and Media Center. We would also be using the Chromebooks regularly outside of the testing window to support projects and uh, research multimedia presentations. Included in that project also was funding for Google Apps, which will allow... Which is new for... Which is new at the at Middlebrook, Middle which will allow students to have email accounts and Google accounts with a Wilton Public Schools address at the end, and teachers can collaborate and do all the great things that you can do with Google Apps. The reason why I ask about what part of that is the new part 
is to see whether or not it may qualify for grant funding either from PTA or WEF. And because I know that they do new initiatives and that sort of thing, so if any of that is under that umbrella of, as a new initiative, then that's an avenue to explore. Is just something I want to put What's out. What's the cost of that card? Seventeen. You don't have your sheet in front. No, I don't. Oh. Seventeen, seven, nineteen. <laughs> Thanks. Seventeen. Okay. Seven. I'll uh, <clears throat> I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, the budget adjustment keeping the curriculum days adjusting the insurance uh, and accepting the other adjustments and, and cutting the card second all in favor thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. To adjourn. motion to adjourn so moved all in favor <laughs> Aye. Aye.